Hello and welcome to the England Rugby Podcast with O2 Inside Line. I'm Dylan Hartley and this week I'm joined by Mark Wilson and Johnny Hill. Boys, thank you for joining me this evening. Um, let's start with the game on Saturday. Just a quick word on it. Uh, not the way you wanted to start the tournament, um, obviously with a loss. What, what was said in the change room afterwards? Uh, Wilkes, you're, you're the, the senior statesman here. I'll, I'll fire that one to you. Um, I think, obviously, we all knew that we, we didn't perform to anywhere near of what we're capable of. Um, and uh, the boss and, and the leaders were pretty clear in the fact of we, we, we had to, uh, to park it pretty quick because obviously this tournament comes thick and fast and we know we know how disappointing we were on the day so there's no point kind of feeling sorry for ourselves and you know that's the first thing Eddie said don't put your head down let's just get on with it and that's what we're uh, that's what we're trying to aim to do now Johnny what about you like do you feel like your boys didn't fire a shot uh, yeah definitely um, I think I think uh, early doors we we potentially we potentially had opportunities to fire shots in the first half, especially, and we never did. And, and credit to Scotland, they came, they came with a plan and they, and they had a lot of intent with, with how they played. And, and they, they took the sting out of us a little bit. But yeah, it was, it was really frustrating to, to kind of build up to the start of the tournament like that and, and then just be suppressed like straight away almost. So it's about us kind of bouncing back now and just reacting and, and moving on to the next one. Mate, if, if history is anything to go by, um, is a pretty good lesson in last year with, with that opening game in Paris and then you boys going on to lift the silverware. Those sorts of losses, uh, I'd rather it early on in a, a campaign so you can rectify those things. And I think it's probably the best thing for you boys. It's happened nice and early, little blip on your radar. And, and looking at you guys from the outside, you're a bloody, you're a consistent team, you know? So it's, it's a nice little kick up the backside and, I've got no doubt you boys are going to come back stronger. Um, one thing I wanted to pick up on, um, special moment for big uh, Ben Urbano yesterday. How did you make it special for, for him? He managed to, um, I think Marrow managed to get a, a few videos off his family sent sent through and uh, there was um, there's some good characters on there from his family sending through some nice messages and we had a bit of a laugh and also, you know, quite touching as well. Like it was special for him to, to make his to make his uh, debut, so uh, the night before, obviously we got together uh, outside, socially distanced in the, in the marquee, all freezing cold. But you know, being able to get those messages off his family was pretty special. And uh, and and uh, obviously after the game, he 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 did his he did his song back at the hotel as well. Lovely. Anything to add, Johnny? No, just just kind of echo what what Will said. It's it's really. Having been capped recently, um, it's a really important day for, for, for Benno and us not getting the right side of the result, but we still have to make it a, like a good day for him and a good evening. So it's really important that we remember the feeling from the game, but celebrating that day for Benno is 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 as important as well. So um, it was nice to, nice to be in there with him and enjoy the evening. Beauty. Well, congrats to him. Uh, let's... Change the subject, wind it back a bit. Um, even though Six Nations last year feels like about a decade ago. Uh, coming back from Japan and the run-up to the 2020 Championship, it was an interesting time for you, Wilkes. Um, obviously, going to sail, been out for three months, getting back fit, just in time. Tell us about that. Uh, yeah, it was a bit of a crazy time. Um, I was living mainly out of my car, swinging between Newcastle and, and Manchester uh, until I decided to get a flat which was two streets near Curry, which was, uh, I didn't know whether that was a good decision or a bad decision at the time. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it was, it, you know, sale were brilliant in the fact that they um, allowed me to uh, do my rehabs and stuff there. They could have easily turned around and said, you know, you know, don't bother coming. Uh, so, you know, I managed to have a couple of games for them and then, and then luckily enough to get back for the, for the championship uh, and, uh, and playing in the Wales game. So, it was um, it was quite a tough rehab. Like I, I'd already had the knee knee problem before, but uh, you know the, the the staff there were brilliant with us, and and uh, yeah, I was just glad to get back on the pitch with the boys uh, with these boys here. We'll, we'll go into this a little bit later, but um, you're a bit of a late bloomer to the the international scene. Um, 
did you did you ever fear like with that sort of injury you might not get that opportunity again? And obviously, when you do get back to play, um, you know what did that mean to you? That sort of pride, you know how how did Hold a second. <laughs> What's, what's happened there? I, don't know I was like, is this gone. my setup? No, it's Wilson's setup. I don't know why the light's gone. Hold on, wait there. <laughs> I just, I just, I'll just do a little circle on the laptop. So, I'll ask so, you that again. Sorry, um, Dills. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't even remember what I asked you now. Um, late bloomer. We'll start the whole thing. <laughs> I said you've um, obviously been a, a late bloomer to the international scene. We'll, we'll go into that a bit later. But um, obviously getting injured, do, were you worried or concerned that you might not get that opportunity again? And then when you finally got back, you know, how good did that feel? Oh yeah, that, straight away I kind of questioned that and and started to you know the, you sometimes fear the worst. Um, you know, you know you know yourself how much of a special thing it is to play for your country, and uh, I think it just made me realise how grateful I am for the for the opportunity. And and when when I got the call up for Wales, it just kind of it was almost more you know one of the most exciting games I played for, for uh, you know played for England. Um, obviously, people talk about the debuts and. And some of the World Cup games, but you know that that opportunity to after coming back off the off a decent injury, um, yeah, it was it was exciting, but certainly certainly made me realise how grateful we are to to, to play. Hundred uh, percent, Johnny. I can see you nodding off there. You just said a big roast dinner. Um, let's bring you in there. This time last year, um, how were you feeling about that elusive first cap? You've been you've been chasing it for a while. Um, did you ever think you'd be sat here, domestic, European, and Six Nations champ? Um, you know, how, how's that been for you? Um, yeah, it's, it's been a, a, a whirlwind kind of 12 months, to be honest. Um, to, to have the lockdown and the, and the lows of the year and, and then to kind of I set some goals over lockdown and, and the, 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 the team, the Chiefs, we set some goals and we wanted to, to go out and to win, win some trophies. It was, it was like a, obviously a shortened season when we returned, so... It was about us getting in the best shape possible individually, doing our own programs, and then hitting the hitting the ground running. Um, and and we did as a side, and and thankfully, I got I got selected in a lot of those games, and, and I got recognised by Eddie by my form. So I was really thankful of of my teammates at the club as well that, that kind of helped me along the way because I couldn't I can't really do that without those guys and. And to be playing, to be pl playing on this stage now is just is everything that I ever could have wished for, to be honest. Um, and when I played at the weekend against Scotland, it was just stood there listening to the anthems, and it was just like, again, that, it's something I, I know that I'll never take for granted playing for my country because it's um, it's uh, yeah, like I say, something that I've built up for for a long, long time. Good on you, mate. Uh, must be a bit of a whirlwind for you. And you got like um, Luke Cowan, Dicky, Jack Knoll, Henry Slade, and you obviously got um, Hoggy down there. Did you always look at those international boys and think, oh, I, want, I want a bit of that. I want a piece of that. Like, when, when's my time going to come? Or were you just kind of plugging away um, and the opportunity presented itself? Or were you really, really, really going for it? Were you pushing yourself for that for that chance? Yeah, I, I've, I kind of saw the, those guys... Um, the way they trained at the club and, and how professional they are. And I was like, I'm, I'm jumping aboard that ship. I, I want a piece of that pie, to be honest. So I did everything that I could. Um, and no matter how how well I was playing, I just wanted to take the, the selection out of Eddie's hands. I wanted him to have to pick me because I was I was so good. I didn't want him to have to make a decision, you know? Oh, good on you, mate. Um, does help when you're winning uh, European titles. <laughs> yeah, for Premiership sure. titles, you know what I mean? It's, um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right, enough of the serious stuff. Uh, first song from you. What was it? <laughs> you want me to sing a song now? No, no. It's, well, I mean, if you're oh, offering, okay. I was, on, I was actually just asking what the song was. <laughs> I thought Come you on, said enough of the serious stuff. <laughs> I sing a song last time. I did say that. And O2 <laughs> want you to sing a song. So sing the song. <laughs> oh, I sang American Pie by Don McLean. Oh. A classic, but been used so many times before. Uh, Wilson, can you throw it back to twenty? What was it? Twenty eighteen? Twenty seventeen? Yeah. Um, uh, it was Paolo, Paolo Nutini last request. Oh my and, gosh! Uh, I wish I could remember I, that, but I it can't. Was on the, it was it was on the bus, and I remember 
I remember DC saying to me afterwards, he was like, why did you keep making eye contact with me? After, <laughs> you know, it's like quite a romantic song. I was like, mate, you're just in my, you were just in my uh, line of vision. You know what I mean? I wasn't, I wasn't looking at you specifically. I'll tell you why. Because I think he's just been voted most handsome man in rugby or something like that, oh hasn't he? <laughs> he is slightly dreamy as uh, Danny Kerr. Right, um, let, let's talk about your early stories. Um, you know, we've, we've talked about the here and now. I want to know, about your journeys getting to where you are. Um, I alluded to it earlier. Wilkes, you are a hell of a late bloomer. Um, in a few respects, actually. <laughs> I've, I've done my research on you about your academy days and whatnot. Tell us a little bit about your journey getting to even professional rugby. First of all, I, I didn't start rugby till I was at secondary school. Uh, I didn't go to a, a, a rugby school. It was just a... It was um, just... I had, a, I had a, t- a teacher called Dean Barker who was... Uh, mad into his rugby and he kind of took me under his wing um, and then when I when I got to kind of 13, 14 uh, he got in touch with the guys at Newcastle uh, guy John Fletcher and Pete Walton at the time um, that's, that's going back a long time now isn't it <laughs> uh, and they invited me over to to have a bit of like a couple of days kind of trial and uh, I've, I've, ne- I've never been away since so um you know, I did. I didn't. It didn't all go swimmingly well during the academy. I missed out on a couple of under 18s tours that went to Ireland. A couple of times, I started questioning whether whether they were going to keep us on. But I went to uni over in Northumbria and played a bit of student rugby. Uh, played a bit of uh, local rugby down at Boyne Rugby Club as well. And uh, uh, Alan Tate at the time, who was first team coach, signed us up in 2010. And even he said then he. he when he realised I was only nineteen, he was he was buzzing because he thought I was twenty six. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so that was that was that was pretty much the, the start of it. Um, starting with Newcastle, yeah. And um, I, I read up that you um, you did a lot of miles, mate. I mean, your dad did a lot of miles, and your taste of music is basically kind of driving power ballads um, <laughs> yeah. because of the the CDs you used to get through with your dad on the way to training and back. Yeah, yeah. Well, obviously, we'd we'd uh, every fortnight we'd go over to Newcastle, so you know it's a good two hour journey. And and one thing that he always did was he was in charge of the music, and I had to just see if I could listen, even if I didn't like it. So I learned to love it. Uh, <laughs> so there's all sorts of rock ballads. There's even some Bee Gees in there. There's also a Fleetwood Mac was his favourite. Fleetwood Mac. So. Yeah, I've, I've got a, I've got a little bit of older taste of music than some of these young boys now. I mean, I'm, I'm nodding because I know those people, but um, <laughs> any of our younger listeners might have to Google those. Um, Johnny, what about you? A uh, bit of rugby pedigree in your family? Um, farming background, I read. Yeah. Is, that, is that right? I, I actually had to double check this. Um, I... I, I <laughs> I read that your dad is in the stock market, and I thought he was like some sort of like city broker. But if you've got a farming pedigree, um, I think I'm guessing the wrong stock. Yeah, right? he's he's probably the opposite, like furthest thing away from a stockbroker. <laughs> he shovels poo for a living. Okay. Fine. Yeah. <laughs> but what, what about your um, early days, mate? How how did you end up um, to? How did you find your way to rugby? Um. So I was I was kind of late as well. I played a lot of football when I was younger. Um, but going back to the pedigree thing, my uncle, my mum's twin brother was a, was a rugby league player, uh, Paul Lachlan, he played for St. Helens and, and whatnot. Um, and I always really looked up to him. Um, and he kind of got me into, into like rugby as a whole. And then, uh, after playing a bit of football, I, I, I went with my brother to a Lucktonians rugby club, um, and played there from like under nines, um, but still interlinked with football as well. So I kind of put it put it down again, and I enjoy like shooting, fishing, things like that. Never really took it too serious, and I went back and played Colts at like under nineteens, and started to enjoy the rugby a bit more because there was a social element to it after as well. So I enjoyed that, um, and then my, my coach kind of said. I don't think you realise that you've got something very important in rugby and no one can coach six foot seven. <laughs> and I was like, I don't really, didn't really get what he's talking about. He's like, look, you can catch a ball and you're really tall. There's a shortage of you in the country. So I think you should go to Hartbury College and um, and just give it, a, give it a crack. And I was, I was 17 at the time. 
Um, so I was spoke, spoke to my dad about it and he said, yeah, yeah, why not? Let's do it. Um, so I went down there and, and got selected to play in the, in the, in the Harbury side and played with a lot of, to be fair, the, the side is uh, it was like me, Ellis Gen, Elliot, Elliot Stook, Billy Burns, um, Ross Moriarty, Callum Braley, like there's Lewis Ludlow, there's some good guys in that side and playing, playing with those guys every Wednesday afternoon was, was like, was kind of the pinnacle of rugby for me um, as the growing up and enjoyed all of that stuff and then got picked, for, picked up by Gloucester, had a season and a half there and then transferred down to Exeter and had six years at Exeter now and um, got, me, got me to here. It's not the first time I've heard Hartbury mentioned on this uh, this podcast. Quite a lot of pedigree coming out of there. Um, I can imagine the social element, uh, Hartbury, with those boys is pretty good as well. Yeah, yeah, it's a uh, really, really good fun. Wednesday nights in uh, in Gloucester, also known as Gloss Vegas. It was uh, some good evenings. Did your dad like kind of drop you off and say good luck to you? Um, if this doesn't work out, you come back to the farm type thing. Was that ever an option or? You know, if, if you weren't playing now, what, what sort of thing would you be doing, you reckon? Yeah, definitely. You hit the nail on the head there. Um, he was just like, just go and give it a go and don't worry about it. Um, you can come back and play for your, play for Lactonians and work on the farm. I'd be, I'd be involved in farming, yeah, for sure, uh, if I wasn't a rugby player. But yeah, he dropped me off and I called him up like a couple of weeks later. I was like, oh, I'm, I'm in the first team. And he, he didn't believe me. <laughs> of course you are, like, son. Of course really? you are. <laughs> Um, Wills, uh, well, it's a question for both of you actually. What was playing for England from an early age something that you dreamed and aspired to do, or did it just kind of happen over time? Oh, 100%. It was something that I, um, that I dreamt about, I th- but I think that my first thing was becoming professional. That was my biggest goal to start with, and I always had that just in the background, just kind of really like kind of hoping for. And then obviously once the professional career started kicking off and that's when the, the hunger and the desire to play for England obviously grew and grew and grew. Uh, and, you know, you end up chasing it hard because uh, that's what you, that's what you, you know, that's a pinnacle of, uh, of, of what you're doing and, and why we play rugby. So it was definitely something that I chased really hard. Did, did you ever think, because you, you got capped at 28, a lot of people would think the ship has sailed at that point. You know, everyone kind of thinks you've got to make an impression from a young age. And once you're in the system, that's you done, basically. And, and if you've missed that boat or that ship is sailed, like I said, people kind of give up on that. Like your, your story is unbelievable in terms of resilience, patience, whatever you want to call it. Did you ever think you'd miss that chance or you just kept plugging away? What what was it? Um, I think there was, there was, I'd be lying if I said there was times where I started to question whether it would ever happen, but... Uh, I also am really grateful with the way that it panned out because um, it kept me hungry. Do you know what I mean? It kept, it kept me hungry for it and I, and I wanted to keep chasing it because I always believed that there might, there might be a chance. And I also reckon that uh, that when I was 21, 22, with the likes of these back row lads like Tom Curry and Ben Hill, like I was nowhere near as good as them. Like nowhere near uh, at that age. But what... I was really grateful for was that throughout my career at Newcastle and playing week in, week out for, for them made me grow as a player and get better as a player. And and I, th- I just think that I probably was ready at the time in which I got got the call. And I'm, I'm so pleased it panned out the way it did. It's a great story, mate. Just <laughs> keep chipping away. Uh, Johnny, what about you? Obviously, 20, 26 when you got capped. Am I right in saying you, you paired with Mara Toje in England under-20s? Yeah, I, I played in the uh, in the Six Nations campaign. There was me, Mara and Charlie. We we're, were the three second rows and Tom Ellis as well from Bath. Um, so I kind of, I, I got, had a few injuries between under 20s and, and making my premiership debut. Um, and f- for me to sit back on the sidelines and, w- and watch those guys, Charlie and Mara and Tom Ellis make, make premiership debuts and, and, gain international experience and and they're like regular premiership players I, I, I gain confidence from that um and I just very similar to Wills to just kept chipping away and I knew that me being the the best Chiefs player I could be would 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 help me um and then as as I got 
as I got older and more experienced, I then kind of moved my focus towards playing for England then. And it was like kind of two years ago, since going on the, the tour to South Africa, I wanted to, I had I had a taste of the tour and I was watching watching all these professionals, how they do things even like Monday to Friday. And I, I learned a lot from them. And, and that's when I really started to accelerate my, my kind of hard work towards it. I'm going to ask you kind of like um, a deeper question here. Like obviously maro has been on the scene for three, three, four years now. Um, and, you know, my opinion is he's a world-class player. You're obviously coming through the, the ranks with them. Did you ever think, like, if I wish I was there with Maro doing that and maybe I'm not good enough? Did you ever have that conversation with you with, with yourself? Because um, it, it must be I'll, hard seeing your peers. You know what I mean? Like, you, you named all those boys you're at Hartbury with all kind of excelling from a really young age, getting um their time in the limelight getting international caps getting that regular premiership rugby did you ever question yourself um yeah I I, I did definitely um but like I said I, um, I gained confidence because I'd I'd kind of rub shoulders with those guys at early ages and if they can do it I can do it sort of thing um so I, I just gained I gained confidence from from them doing it and to to see those guys like watching Ross and Mara go on go on the Lions tour, I was like, I was really, really happy for them, and like, so I I can do that as well. I can do that. Um, these guys are great players, but I've been there with them. And I know what they're about. Decent. I mean, there's nothing like your stories, but I missed out on like the first fifteen when I was twelve. Um, I was like three kids that went to. Oh no, I think twenty five kids went to a trial and three didn't get picked. I didn't make the first of email. It cut me deep. And uh, I got told I was a bit too big at the time. So since that, you know, that moment at 12, 13 years old, I started running like 3K every day. Um, I still ended up in the front row mine. Um, but I think I instilled a pretty good habit that day to kind of uh, have a deal with a setback. You know what I mean? Uh, Will, I'm going to throw it back to when I first met you. Um, uh, the boys, the majority of our team went on the Lions tour. Um and we took a very, very young team to Argentina. And I was sat there with Danny Kerr, Joe Launchbury, George Ford, uh, Johnny May, Chris Robshaw. There was like five or six of us kind of uh, caught, you know, we'd been around that England team a, a long time. And we inherited like 20 odd 18, 19, 20 year olds. <laughs> and we'd, you know, we didn't know how to communicate with these guys like, we, we inherited this whole new team where they didn't understand how we needed to train, how we prepared. It was a big job. And um, to make it worse, my roommate for the tour was Tom Curry, <laughs> 18 years old, straight out of boarding school. Like it was like babysitting 24 yeah. seven. It was unbelievable. And I, I just remember that tour. There, there was a couple of guys that kind of came into the, the fray there, Piers Francis and yourself, slightly more experienced and for me, having some older gray heads in the side, guys that could understand how to prepare, understand professionalism, understand how to enjoy a tour um, was, was massive. So it's, I don't know what I'm saying. I'm just saying thank you for being on that tour because you helped me out a lot, mate. <laughs> and I mean, yeah. imagine it would have been brilliant if you were my roommate. We, we would have had a great old time. But um, have you got any, got any early memories of that tour? Yeah, well, I, I I just remember thinking the same. I, I remember thinking the, uh, um, you know, these these the, you know we had the Curry brothers, we had uh, Nick Azikwe, uh, and it was quite refreshing because it was kind of like like I said we were the more elder statesmen, but they were um, they were like a bundle of like a big ball of energy, weren't they? And it was um, and it was fun. It was good. It was obviously it was the first intro to to Eddie's way of training as well, which was a bit of a shock to the system. Um, you know the intensity with sessions were were were, were tough. Uh, I, I I'll always remember we did like a team run and, and Ben Curry chopped Joe Launchbury, chop tackled Joe Launchbury. And that, now Launch is a pretty chill out guy, isn't he? Most of the time, but I've never seen the guy so angry because this eighteen year old before the first test has absolutely chopped him in half. This is Friday this afternoon, is, right? This is Friday afternoon before before the game. And I'm thinking, Ben, what are you doing? It's our number one second row, you know what I mean? Uh, and you've just chop-tackled him the day before a game. Um, 
But yeah, no, it was it was a good it was good, it was a good tour and because uh, we had a couple of days after the tour finished, didn't we? Out there, we had a couple of you know, so we had a good social at the end of it as well, which was good. And you don't know, but I've got some lovely photos of uh, you and my phone, Wilkes. You and Neil oh. Hadley actually <laughs> oh, no. having a good snooze on the bus um, after <laughs> last night. I just want to pick up on something you just mentioned there with that young group. Like you said, it was the first time you had experienced you know, Eddie's style of training. So by that point, you know, that core group of players that I mentioned before, we had had two years of it. So we understood how to prepare. You at 28 years old, did you think you had it worked out? You know, you've been doing it for 10 odd years. And all of a sudden, is that a bit of a curveball to work, work with someone like Eddie? And how has that kind of made you progress even further as a player now? And I think the the, the beauty of, of what, um, it, what it did was I, I learned about actually actually how how to train and how to prepare yourself properly for a game. Now that's not that's not any disrespect to the to the uh, training regimes we had at club level, but it was just kind of we just had a deeper understanding of what you know what day is got to go hard. Because obviously the game training day that we that we have during the week is is a way of you know mentally and physically getting yourself right to to play for the weekend. And sometimes obviously you know. When you've got like big club campaigns, like it's it's about managing yourself, really, isn't it? You know, some some lads don't turn up till team run day, whereas you know for for internationals, and especially the way that Eddie obviously wants to prepare us, we we've got to be training at a uh, you know a, a high intensity to be able to be to be ready to to perform on, on in the test match, um, and that was and that was a big learning curve, but certainly. As even even you know each camp that we have, like I'm always learning ways in which that you know how to how to manage yourself through the week and what days you need to go really intense and what days you need to chill out uh, and recover. So um, I think that the beauty of what he does is he explains why everything's done and why it, you know why it's done and that's and that's good to know as a player. Yeah, if there's one man that needs to learn to chill out in terms of training, it's you. <laughs> Fittest man in the England rugby team, hardest working man. Um, Johnny, you, you didn't experience it, Johnny, but I was one of the older players when I was there and Eddie's remit for me was like, you're one of the oldest here, so you're going to be one of the hardest working. So if they all see the old guy working really hard, it sets an example. And um, that was my job, basically. Uh, Johnny, your, your first kind of England involvement, um, 2018, South Africa, you obviously didn't play, but did, you know, was it tough on that that front, or did you just enjoy the the tour to, like you say, rub shoulders with those boys and, and be there finally? But as as Eddie explained in the media last week, I spent three weeks on the toilet from some dodgy biltong. Is that is that true or not? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is that why you didn't play? Is it why you suggested you didn't play? Uh, I was I was ill for quite a bit of it and uh, I lost quite a bit of weight to be honest. Um, but yeah, to be honest, I, I enjoyed I enjoyed all of it. Um, and I, I believe that everything happens for a reason. Um, and at the time, I thought I was ready to play Test Rugby. But when I look back, I'm like, <laughs> I was miles off it. <laughs> like, I'm glad he didn't put me on that day because um, I could have been made a fall out of. Um, so it was it was an experience that I'm, that I'm happy for. And it's something that I, I learned a lot, a lot of, like I said earlier, just rubbing shoulders with those guys was, was really important for me to gain confidence, just going back to my club and, and seeing, seeing that step above. Nice. What, what, um, I, I want to delve into like what you have learned and what you're doing now. Like I find it really interesting because I, I can only relate to, to my journey to, to an England shirt. It was kind of easy coming through when there's no expectation on you. Um, probably doesn't really fit here because you waited to 28 years old works. And, and Johnny, you waited too a bit longer. But I seem to get to an England shirt with relatively a smooth path, as in there was retiring players, you know, the Steve Thompsons, the Ronnie Regans were kind of leaving the game. And there was kind of like a clear pathway for me to go get capped. And no one really knows who you are on the scene. You come through a couple of carries. I used to carry the ball really well, Johnny. Like when I was 19, 20, I was like a young Luke Cowan Dicky, mate, honestly. <laughs> you offloads here here and there. I even put boot, I even put boot to ball um, <laughs> a few times a game. Um, like a young Jamie George, but it all kind of got drilled out of me by the time I retired. But I kind of got there and it was 
always going to happen. I got there, but then I found once I was there, that's where the actual work began. Because as soon as you're there, it's like there's this narrative of you're not good enough or there's direct competition. There's a, a Rob Weber, Tom Young's lead. Mayor Steve Thompson to come out of retirement again. He wants another go. There's this direct competition. So then like the penny drops, you've got to start doing a bit more. You've got to start working. And I find it really interesting that you said, Johnny, like you thought you were ready, but then you saw what it was about and you went away and worked. What are you both doing now to basically make sure you stay there? Uh, Will, so I don't know if you'd be there for another decade, but um, <laughs> what, what are you doing to make sure you get the, the, the most out of this opportunity? Johnny, you first. Um, I think the most important thing, the, the thing that everyone sees on the field is your body. Um, and we are, we are bodies and it is the most important thing. You need to make, you need to invest in yourself. Um, and that's not, monetary values that it's just like grafting to make sure your body is right like today and tomorrow is is about me getting myself right to train for the, for the week to prepare to prepare for the game and the mental side of it as well um of like recovering the mind and getting ready to move on to the next challenge um and then so for instance, over Christmas, had two weeks off over Christmas it, it's great and it's like oh well done you got two weeks for Christmas but it's it's I'm not going to sit at Christmas day and eat a, a ton load of food because it's not going to be good for me in the long run. So like, think, let's think about kind of, it's all about planning and being diligent with, with like the Monday to Friday stuff. Um, so oh, I, please I, just I, tell I, me you did like a, a Rocky moment on Christmas day and you went out the farm <laughs> and you started doing a whole lot of fun, like towing tractors and stuff like that. <laughs> no, no, I just, I just, uh, I did uh, some, some fasted cardio before the day started. So then I knew I was on a deficit for, <laughs> before I could pilot it. <laughs> <laughs> Not a diet. Um, it's just yeah. little things like that. It's just making sure it's about, an, I think it's more about an awareness thing. And as, as I've kind of got older, I've I realized what my body appreciates and what my body doesn't appreciate. And it's about listening to your body as well. Um, and just, and like I say, investing in yourself and, and being diligent with it. Well, I'm, I'm going to come back to you in a second, Johnny. Will, what about you? What, what's kind of, how are you kind of ratcheting, notching things up to make sure you stay there? Um, I think for, for me, I've, I, my tendency has always been trying to train every day at hundred percent. And what I kind of found over the last 18 months is that injuries have crept in, crept in. And obviously with being slightly aging, as you've alluded to, uh, <laughs> slightly aging athlete, um, my big learning curve and a lot of the chats that I've had with the SNC guys here is actually knowing when to go 100% and then knowing when to take it right down to, right, you need to chill and do nothing today. Um, and just really trying to manage your body a lot more and, invest more time in, in recovery. And I think that's a big thing of like when I first, when I first joined here and um, realizing the amount of t time you've got to spend in, in your recovery, like, you, you know, Johnny May, the master of recovery, like, um, you know, him and Ford and the way that they conduct themselves around that for me was mind blowing. I was like, I can't believe these boys, you know, how much time to spend on it sometimes i'd just you know sit on a bike for 10 minutes and that'll be it. that'll be it you know what i mean so i think that's just an excuse for johnny and 40 to be in each other's pockets it's slightly <laughs> creepy <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah it's, it's um yeah just just that just just making sure that that i'm right to train as hard as i can in the in, in the midweek and then being able to to charge around for 80 minutes on a saturday 80 minutes. Jeez, I was playing 40 minutes by then. Um, you, I love how you talk about like investing in yourself, but in terms of investing actual money and buying kit to look after yourselves, whether that be meal prep, meal plans, are you doing extra kind of training, you know, recovery setups at home? You know, what, what sort of time, or no, not time, what sort of money are you investing? I'm not asking for figures, but have you got like a key bit of kit that you rely on or, or meal prep? What is it, Johnny, anything? Um, I'd, I'd, I'd use a, um, a farm shop back in Exeter with, that has really good, really good meat. And I like to make sure that I'm eating the right stuff, really quality food. Oh, man, that's me. Nah, it's just, it's just normal, just foam rollers, like 
a stretching band doesn't cost hardly anything, you know. It's just it's more that it's more the time, the time that is with it really. Okay, Will, sort about you. Uh, just just with my like joint issues, I've had like a game ready ice machine. Obviously, that's that's a vital bit of kit for me at the minute. Um, you know, if we have a big, if we have a big session, like being able to put that on, on an evening and just basically calm everything back down, <laughs> calm everything back down is, uh, is is vital. And um, we've got these things like sauna blankets now. I don't know. I know that it's crazy, isn't it? Can you uh, recommend? Or? Uh, well, but, well, but, well, yeah, they're, they're very good. Um, obviously, with like lockdown, things like saunas, you can't go in saunas, can you? Um, you know, they're not open to, you know, we can't use the, facility, the spa facilities here. So this blanket is obviously you just wrap yourself up and the, the electrodes get going. And uh, yeah, it's um, sitting there for 20 minutes. You come out and you've lost <laughs> you've lost a couple, couple of kilos. Uh, I um, I heard that uh, infrared sauna, like an hour in there is worth 500 odd calories. It's the same as going for like an hour's jog or something. I was going to say, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> I mean... Yeah. You must be you and Johnny May must be one of the leanest players in the team. Like if, if you're if you're recommending that, Will, so I'm I'm signing up right now. I might wrap myself in three. Be like a That's pig in a blanket. <laughs> Boy, look at the farmer. He likes that. He's getting on the side of pigs and blankets. <laughs> um, let's talk about USPs. Unique selling points. Johnny Hill. What is yours? What is your skill area of the game? Your strongest attributes. I, I like your hero, if I'm honest. But what about your game? What what is it that you bring to the game that you think is your strong point? Well, I'm quite laid back, um, and I think that's a strength of mine. Um, so I just I enjoy enjoy relaxing, and I quite like. I think I can bring like a calmness around the squad. Okay, are you calmer than Courtney Laws? No, <laughs> no, he's Jamaican. You can't get any more laid back than Jamaican Courtney Laws. Honestly, no, he's very calm. He is, yeah. Uh, for a man with four kids, he's the most chilled man alive. <laughs> yeah, he That's is. why he loves being in camp so much, Will. So you know all about that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've got an inkling to what your USP is, Mark Wilson. Uh, why don't you tell us what you think it is? Um, <laughs> no, nah, look, from a, from a rugby perspective, obviously, you know, I, I, I like working hard. Uh, I like working hard from teammates and um, trying to be the best team teammate I can be um, and that's like off the field as well um, I think it's important that you know that you that you're a good team man around camp when especially when lads are um, you know might be missing home or um, you know being in the de- you know the pressures of sometimes but what the camp can bring and I think it's important that they've got people around them that uh, are pretty level-headed so um, you know that's what I'd probably say what I'd like to think is what I, I bring to the camp Hard work, graft. And uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and uh, a lovely, earthy man. You're an earthy <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. You're like, you're like we'll a father. We'll, we'll go with that, yeah, yeah, yeah. The father um, figure. <laughs> I mean, not my comment at all, but um, uh, there's a lot of love on social media for your physique, uh, Mark Wilson. Johnny Hill, if you could stand Johnny May and Mark Wilson next to each other, whose physique would you prefer? Matt Wilson, Wilson for sure, yeah. Careful what you say, John. Matt Wilson, definitely, yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, I mean, like, it's, funny like, like, it's funny that like, I prefer Johnny's actually. <laughs> Johnny, Johnny Mays. He's well, the, he's the leanest man I've ever seen. I'd say if I could just do what Johnny May does, that'd be brilliant. <laughs> uh, um, that's what three hours a day stretching um, can do for you. Going back to the USB things, um, things you're not so good at, you know. My experience with any high performance setup, you get some pretty direct feedback on what needs improving. Um, obviously, as the individual, as the athlete, as the player, you've got to go ask the questions and seek advice on how to get better. But have you guys been kind of directed to what needs to work on? I mean, you know, Will, at, at the ripe old age that you are, I don't know how many times I'm going to refer to your age in this podcast. I'm sorry. But Johnny, even as a, a younger player, have you had some pretty direct feedback on, on what you need to improve on? Um, I think I think you can always be fitter. Um, and it's something that I, I've always kind of dreaded. You know, when you're on the line and he's like, you're on your front in five seconds and you're going to run to the other line and you're going to go down up and come back and being 
being like on that line nervous it's I find I get that I kind of get that like anxiety and it's it's like you know you're alive you know <laughs> when you're doing that and when you're doing four when you've done four reps out of like 10 you then you really do know you're alive you know <laughs> I was gonna so say like that do, do you look to someone older in the team like Wills whose USP is hard work and graft and how fit he is do you see that as inspiring that he's doing that he, yeah, I'm, definitely, I'm yeah. assuming he's streets ahead of you in those runs and getting off the floor as well. Probably not. Have you seen how long his stride length is? <laughs> what, when he gets going, he's going. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Galloping away. <laughs> um, no, genuine though, do, do you look to other boys in the team and does that make you think, oh, I need to get up to that, you know, I need to be up to scratch, I need to catch up with him? Yeah, definitely. It's something we've spoken about. It's it's infectious. The one thing I do miss from being in that high performance, that international setup, is being pushed every day. You, you're kind of superhuman where you're at the moment. It, it's amazing. So keep enjoying it. We'll stay there for another 10 years. Johnny, much more to come from you. Mark Wilson, Johnny Hill, thank you for joining me this evening. Uh, I understand you've got birthday cake to go enjoy. Yes, yeah. mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> thank you, boys. Cheers, Dills. Good luck this week. Cheers, Dills. Thanks very much. Good night.